If you want a head start, jump over to Acts chapter 4. We got a lot of scripture to get through this morning and only about two hours to get through it. I've got a flight to catch in Norfolk. I'm flying across the country. Uh, and we, um, it, that's actually a joke. The reason it's a joke and the reason it's actually funny is because on our communication team here at Crosswalk, I am known for the shortest messages. Right? In fact, when the lights came up, some of you were like, yes. We're getting out of here early today, but that's not the case, not today. The reason is because I got in trouble last time for the short message. They say nobody complains about a short sermon. That's not true. I actually walked out of the doors of the auditorium. I got to the kids' walk area, and my seven-year-old daughter was waiting there with her arms folded. She said, did you preach today? I said, yes. She said, well, I'm mad at you. I said, why? Why? She said, Dad, they didn't even get to the candy in Kids Walk. That was way too short. So we're going to do two things today. We're going to unpack the Word of God together, and we are going to get to the candy in Kids Walk. Okay? Are you ready to go? All right, let's go to Acts chapter 4. We're going to pick up in verse 7. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? So let's identify the them. The them is the Jewish Sanhedrin, the religious leaders of the time. And the this is Peter and John had just met a lame beggar who was asking for money. And they said, silver and gold I do not have. But what I give you, I give you in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And the beggar was healed. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, We are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed. Well, then know this, you and all the people of Israel. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the what? Cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Come on, preach it, Peter. When they saw the courage of Peter and John, they realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, and they were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus. That's what we're going to focus on this today, is that these men had been with Jesus. Let's take a moment and pray. Dear God, we are reading your word. I'm, I'm asking you in this moment for it to come alive to us. You are sowing seeds within our heart that are going to move in a mighty way in our community and in the world around us. Whether we're sitting here today or watching online, I pray, God, that you use this message to change us and to help us become more like you and move into our purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to ask you this. Have you ever saw someone... And you admired something in them and you thought they were just naturally good at it? You thought they were just natural. They were born that way, right? I had a young man who asked me to help him with his finances. And we were sitting down. You could tell he was getting frustrated. And he said, Reese, you don't understand. This just comes naturally to you. I'm struggling with it. It kind of made me laugh a little bit on the inside because... I was going to say I'd be the first to tell you that's not true, but my wife, Lindsay, sitting in the first row would tell you that's not true. When Lindsay and I met, we met about a decade and a half ago at Texas Roadhouse, and we were both servers at Texas Roadhouse, and we'd make a bunch of cash, and at the end of the night, I would stick that cash in my apron, and I'm telling you, there was a magnet in that apron that slowly pulled me over to the Walmart $5 bin. Okay, for many of you who don't know what that is, this is back before Netflix and Hulu. You had to go rent or buy a movie, and I had money to burn, so I would go and buy movies that nobody ever knew what they were. And five years later, I'd wasted all my money because a lot of those movies were never even opened. Titles you've never even heard of before. But that was the problem. I was, I'll put it to you this way, in every marriage, there's a saver and a spender. Which one do you think I was? Right? I was the spender. It wasn't just with my tips. It was with everything. In fact, Lindsay had a motto. I'll let Reese spend everything. I'll spend nothing. That way when we get married, we have something. That was the motto she lived by. And it actually came to a head right after we got married. We went to the bank, Wachovia. Rest in peace, right? It's no longer Wachovia, now Wells Fargo. 
We go to the bank, we walk in, we got that newlywed glow about us. The lady meets us at the door. She says, oh, congratulations on your wedding. You want to combine your accounts today? We sit down in front of this lady. She starts typing on the computer. She notices something. She looks up. She looks at Lindsay. She looks at me. She looks at Lindsay. She says, ma'am, you do know he doesn't have any money in his account. <laughs> Lindsay looks at me. Lindsay looks at the lady. She said, no, I didn't know that. And then the lady said, oh, oh, wait. And I went, she found something. She said, actually, he has a negative balance. Because you see, if you use ATMs, right, and you don't have any money in your account, the overdraft fee makes you go in the other direction, in the negative. She said, ma'am, will you be paying that off today for him? You see, here's the problem. This young man I was helping with his finance was comparing his chapter 3 to my chapter 13. He didn't see the journey. Every product has a process. You see the product, you don't see the process. So when we see Peter here, we got to realize Peter wasn't always this way. Peter wasn't always bold. Peter wasn't always confident. He wasn't always committed. But just like the verse said, he'd been with Jesus. So this morning, we're going to look at three key moments in Peter's life. If you're taking notes this morning, the message is called The Defining, The Refining, and The Reminding. These are the moments that Jesus shapes Peter, and we're going to start with his defining moment. So if you want to get a head start, jump over to Luke chapter 5 is where we find Peter's defining moment. But let me tell you what a defining moment is first. Defining moment is a pivotal decision that brings forth a fundamental change. A pivotal decision that brings forth a fundamental change. And when we find Peter getting ready to experience this defining moment, his name is not Peter. His name is Simon. Simon is on the shore side with his fishing partners, and they are mending their nets, and Jesus comes along with a large crowd that's pushing against him, and he looks and finds two boats. That's what we're going to pick up at in verse 2. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to who? Simon. This is an all play. The one belonging to who? Simon. And he asked him to put it out a little from the shore. He sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down my nets. But because you say so, I will let down my nets. Very important. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that the nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come over and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full they began to sink. When Simon Peter... When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up to the shore, left everything, and followed him. They left everything and followed him. This is a defining moment for Simon. A defining moment. And there's a few lessons we can learn from Simon's defining moment. The first lesson is we don't want to miss our defining moment. Simon could have missed his defining moment. Here's the reality. Defining moments don't come when we're rested and ready. Defining moments often come when we're unfruitful, when we're frustrated, when we feel like we're not getting a result, that's when defining moments come. You see, what happened is they'd fish all night, then they would take the fish to the market, then they'd come back and fish all night again. They caught nothing that night. There was nothing to take to the market. Have you ever worked an overnight shift? Have you ever worked a double in the restaurant business? Maybe for you, you just have somebody at work who never comes to work, and you end up working their shift too, right? And you end up working twice as hard, twice as long. If any of those things are true, you know the feeling that Simon was feeling here being exhausted. But he, it's like doing it and not getting paid for it, though. 
There was no return. There was no fruit from that. So he could have easily said, hey, Jesus, it's great. You got a lot of people showing up. I'm going to go home and get some rest because I got to be back here tonight. I caught nothing. He could have missed the moment. But why didn't he miss the moment? Very simple. Because he made his boat available. He made his boat available. Jesus saw his boat. He knew Simon was a fisherman. He asked for the boat, and Simon made his boat available, rowed Jesus out to the shore so that Jesus could teach to the crowds. But it doesn't stop there. That's only the beginning in making our boat available. We have to go further than that because you also see that Simon was obedient. That was the next step. It wasn't just about being available, but it was about being available and obedient. Because his defining moment didn't happen just beyond the shore. It happened in the deep, right? So I, here's a principle I love. I just mentioned earlier that I coach leadership teams around the country. And a lot of the leadership teams I work with are Chick-fil-A leadership teams. All right? Raise your hand if you've ever eaten a Chick-fil-A before. Okay, yeah, that's pretty much everybody, right? So there's something you know about Chick-fil-A. Is, is it's special, Right? It's special. It's different than other places. And one of the opportunities that I've gotten is I got to meet a lot of owner-operators who spent personal time with the founder, Truett Cathy. They spent personal time with him. And what is very evident in spending time with him is that he built Chick-fil-A with a handbook. This handbook. There are so many principles from here that show up in the Chick-fil-A business. And one that I love that relates to this story is called going the second mile, second mile service. So they say at Chick-fil-A, we're going to give second mile service. It comes from Matthew chapter 5. When somebody asks you to go a mile, go two. Go the second mile. The first mile in the restaurant business at Chick-fil-A is operational excellence, a clean and safe environment. It's about having hospitality. It's about having quality food. That's all the first mile, having clean restrooms, first mile. But you should go way past the first mile, and you should go to the second mile. When a mom comes in, and she's crying, and her world is falling apart, and you see her kids running around the table, you show up with ice cream cones. That's going the second mile. When you see a regular who comes in every year for his birthday, and he just lost his wife, and he's got nobody to make him feel special, so you throw him a birthday party in the restaurant, that's going the second mile, right? All of these other companies are just trying to get to the baseline. They're just trying to get to the quality food. They're just trying to get to the hospitality, the clean restrooms. But at Chick-fil-A, they've already blown past the baseline and they're working into the second mile. That's the principle I want us to see here. It's not about just being available but blowing past that being obedient. Right? Why? Here's the point. You can hear Jesus from the shoreline, but we experience Jesus in the deep. If Simon would have just rowed his boat in right afterwards, he wouldn't have experienced the defining moment in the deep when Jesus told him to cast his net to the other side. You see, it's in the deep that we get fundamentally changed. That's why the de defining moment is there. When I think of the deep, I think of things I can't control. I think of places that I've been unfruitful, places that I've tried to work and nothing has come out of it and now I'm afraid of that place. But he calls Simon into the deep and says, I know what you've done. I want you to cast your net to the other side. You see, here's why it's a paradigm change for, for Simon in the moment. Simon knew Jesus was from God. In the chapter before, this isn't their first meeting. In the chapter before, Simon had heard Jesus teach at the synagogue. He, he had invited him over for lunch. Simon's mother-in-law had a fever. Jesus rebu rebukes the fever. She's healed. She gets up and she starts serving them. So here's Simon thinking, well, he's an amazing teacher. He's a healer. We've just come from 400 years of the intertestamental period where God is silent. Jesus steps on the scene. And Simon's like, there's something special about this person. He's from God. But it is in the deep. That Simon realized that Jesus is not only from God, but that Jesus is God. Creation obeys his words. It's a fundamental change. I see Simon saying, why fish anymore? If this guy shows up, why fish anymore? If he can fill the nets with one word, that's why he is in awe and wonder. And it is in that moment that 
that Simon has an identity change. That's what happens when we're in the deep and we experience Jesus and we learn that Jesus just isn't from God. He is God. We have an identity change. And Simon in one moment goes from being a fisherman who's learning to be a disciple to a disciple who's learning to fish for men. In a single moment, everything changes. Simon has a defining moment. I want to tell you this morning, after your defining moment, you're never the same again. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you're frustrated in, no matter what you're unfruitful in, once you meet Jesus in the deep and you experience him, everything changes. I love the way that 2 Corinthians 5.17 says it. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone and the new is here. When we have our defining moment, we are made new. But what I want you to notice this morning is that's not the end, right? That isn't where it stopped. We don't, we don't have Simon right there. Even though his name gets changed to Peter shortly after by Jesus, we don't, we don't quite get a new person. He still has old habits. So Jesus looks at Simon, changes his name to Peter, and says, I'm going to build my church on you, Peter. Not on you right now, but you're going to have to go through a refining process. We all have to go through a refining process after our defining moment. Here's the point. Just because we get a new name doesn't mean we get a new nature right away. Just because your new wife pays off your debit balance at the bank doesn't mean you get a new nature right away. You still go for $5 cups of coffee when you should just make it at home. You still think we don't have anything cooked, so we'll just go out to eat when you know you should be home cooking. We still think sometimes that taxes are optional and we don't pay them and then we get a bunch of late fees in the mail, right? Speaking of taxes, Joseph. Yep, that happened. I didn't get a new nature right away, even though I'd had a defining moment and neither did Peter. There's an author named Mark Batterson, one of my favorite authors. I love his books. And in his books, he has this quote. He says, we often overestimate what we can do in a year and underestimate what God can do in a decade. That is the refining process. We have to realize this morning that change takes time. Change takes time. When I was researching refining and, and thinking through what that process looks like, precious metals came up. You know, when they refine a precious metal, they extract the impurities out to bring it to its most usable and valuable form. Extract the impurities out to bring it to its most usable and valuable form. I want to tell you this morning, that's what God's doing in our lives. He's bringing us to our most usable form for his kingdom. As he did, Peter, in the refining moments. I like the way the psalmist puts it in Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is anything offensive in me and lead me into the way everlasting. That was David's prayer. Search me, O God. Know my anxious thoughts. What if that was our prayer every morning? What if that was our prayer in the refining process we are going through? Jesus takes us through those moments. I want to take a look at one of Peter's refining moments. He has a lot of them, but one of them that actually happens on the same sea that he was having his defining moment on is in Matthew chapter 14. What's happening here is Jesus is about to put Peter through a leadership exercise. Okay? He just fed the 5,000. He puts Peter on a boat with the disciples and he sends them off across the sea into a storm. That's where the exercise comes in. I, I imagine Jesus walking up the mountain to pray saying, Father, we got to refine this Peter guy. We know we got big things for his life. We got to refine this Peter guy. So we send him off into the storm. Well, early in the morning, the disciples are in the storm and they think the boat is going to fall apart and they see something walking out on the water. They think it's a ghost and everybody freaks out, except Peter, except Peter. Right away, Peter looks and once Jesus says it's him, here's what Peter says in verse 28. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Look at that faith. 
Look at that. Peter is different now. He'd seen Jesus feed the 5,000. He knows Jesus is your provision. He had seen Jesus cast out demons. He knows Jesus is your healer. He had seen Jesus raise a little girl from the dead. He knows Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He's different. His faith has been built. And Jesus gives him one word in verse 29. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat and walked on water and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, I love that word. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? Peter's faith had increased, but Notice he took his focus off Jesus and he saw the wind. And fear filled his heart. You see, when he was trusting Jesus, he had his eyes on him. When he was obeying Jesus, answering to the call come and stepping out of the boat onto the water, Jesus was walking on water and Peter was walking on water. It is when we trust and obey, we become more like Jesus. And we defy the natural into the supernatural. So I know things don't seem to always add up. I know the finances don't add up at the end of the month. I know that the new promotion you seem unqualified for. But listen, it doesn't always add up. When we trust and obey, we defy the natural with the supernatural. And this is a lesson for Peter. This is a lesson for Peter. Because in that moment as he gets distracted, and it's also a lesson for us as we get distracted, faith starts to drain from his heart and fear starts to fill it and his feet start to sink. His feet start to sink because now he is scared. Now he's seeing everything else around him. I, I thought of this as, I was putting this together, I've, I've was recently taught McKenna, our um, about to turn eight-year-old, how to ride a bike. And she did not want to ride on the concrete, so she chose to ride the bike in the backyard. Now, we have 16 trees in our backyard, okay? So it is a danger zone. It is no safer than the street. But she thought it would be easier to fall back there. So we put her on the bike. We take a couple laps around the backyard. She's kind of starting to get the hang of it, building a little bit of confidence. And then I stand at the other end after I feel like she can do this. She can come all the way to me. And I say, McKenna, put your eyes on me. Ride, ride this way. Ride this way. And she starts doing it. And you start seeing the smile come across her face. She's doing it. She's riding the bike like all of her friends. She knows she has the confidence. But all of a sudden, she starts to feel the wobble. Right? All of a sudden, she starts to see that tree's getting closer and closer. And dad's guiding me, but, but I'm starting to look away. I'm starting to look at the other things. And she starts to shake, starts to shake. And then she starts to fall. And I run over and catch the bike. I love that because here it says immediately when Peter starts focusing on the wind and his feet start to sink, Jesus reaches out and grabs him and says, why did you doubt? You can do it, Peter. Why did you doubt? So this morning, if you feel that feeling that you are sinking, that you are in the refining, but you are moving towards failure because fear is filling your heart over the faith as you trust and obey, I want you to know all you have to do is cry out three words, Lord, save me. That's what he said, and Jesus reached out and took his hand. You see, here's the point, is that Jesus is extracting our fear, replacing it with faith, even in our failure. Failure is not final. It might be a business that failed that you had started. It might be a marriage that failed that you had. It might be another relationship that you feel like is failing in your life. Or maybe it's even with your finances that you feel like you're failing. Or maybe you started a New Year's resolution and you just keep failing and failing to get healthier, to do something different. Listen, failure is not final. We are just moving through the refining. But the refining takes time, and we have to be patient in that journey because that journey is full of peaks, and that journey is full of valleys. Peaks and valleys. It is for you. It is for me. It was for Peter. Peter's peaks were literal mountains, the Mount of Transfiguration. He goes up on the mountain. He sees Moses. He sees Elijah. He sees Jesus in his glorified form. You want to talk about a faith builder? We all say, I would never doubt well, imagine seeing Jesus in his glorified form. What was Peter probably saying? I will never doubt that he comes down off the mountain into the lowest low of a valley. Not only does he rebuke Jesus on the way to the cross, but he denies him when he gets there three times. 
three times. After Jesus told him it was going to happen. You understand, that's like having an open book test that they give you the answers to first and you still fail it. Like, how is that possible? It's possible because he was going through the refining process. Needed to happen in the process. But here's, here's the thing. Failure can make you question your identity. And his valley was a really, really, really low valley. The valley that you think I'll never get out of. So Peter's in this valley. He's feeling all of the shame. And he's in need of a reminding moment. He's in need of a reminding moment of why Jesus called him. I can relate to Peter. If you fast forward about seven years after we meet with this lady at the bank, I start changing my habits. Lindsay's teaching me the ways of making your coffee at home. She's teaching me the ways of packing your lunch. She's teaching me the ways to be a good steward. I had a business mentor who, who pulled me to the side and said, you know, I know this is an area you need to develop in. What I want you to do is I want you to read a proverb a day for 31 days. And then, whenever you feel like you're struggling again, do it again, and do it again, and do it again, and you will become a great steward of God's resources. And so I started doing those things. I started feeling really good about we can save money, we got out of debt. All these things started happening. I felt like a great steward. And at the time, I had a uh, financial education business. I had an office in in City Center in Newport News, and, and we had a manageable rent. Everything was great until my eyes got a little bit big. I went out and got an office that was about three times the size. I started thinking, oh, I'll start subleasing this over here and this over here and this over here. I went out and bought a copier, not for the team that I had, but for the team that I wanted. I thought, you know what? If I build it, they will come. Had all of this confidence in me. All of the subleases defaulted on the same day. And the people for the team for the copier that uh, they never showed up. So the problem was I tried to do it in my own strength and I became a complete failure. I remember sitting out in my car in tears thinking, God, I have changed so much yet I fell so big. And then that's when I remembered that this is part of the reminding process. This is part of the reminding process. God wasn't taking me to something. He was taking me through something. He needed to teach me something. And it prepared me for the next and the next and the next season of my life to be a great steward of what he's given me. But we have to realize that when we fail that big, we often try to find our way back in our own strength. Right? We try to find our way back into our own strength. I was trying to work my way out of something I should have been praying my way out of. And that's what happened when we fail as fishers of men we divert back to being fishermen. You saw that with Peter, right? He failed at being a fisher of men, so he diverted back to being a fisherman. If you look, now we're going to move to John 21, all right? This is a gospel safari. We're going to hit three out of the four. Okay, John 21, we're going to see Peter's reminding moment. He goes back to being a fisherman in verse 3. He says, I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. They said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Same guy, same sea, probably the same boat with the same results. That's a really good setup for a reminding moment. Peter had failed. He had failed at being a fisher of men. He had failed at being a fisher men. But I know Peter knew the Old Testament. I know he probably sat under Jesus in that synagogue and listened to Jesus teach the Old Testament. Israel had the same pattern in the Old Testament. Failure after failure after failure. But you know what? When they were unfaithful, they always leaned on God because he was faithful. He had put a promise in Abraham's heart and he was going to see that promise through. And if you see Jeremiah 29, 11, God says to Israel, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. He was reminding Israel that you may be going into exile from what you did, but I will keep my promise. And now Peter, because of what he did, because of his denial, because of his rebuking, because of his failure, he may be at fishing right now, But that's not where God, that's not where Jesus is leaving him. He's going to step in and give him a Jeremiah 29, 11 moment, a reminding moment. In verse 4, he says, early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. 
He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your nets on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul in their net because of such a large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, which is John, said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say it, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. He jumped into the water. This says the disciples followed behind him in a boat. That's the power of a reminding moment. John wrote the gospel, so he probably felt the need to tell us that he told Peter that it was Jesus. I don't think Peter needed to wait that long. Have you ever seen Finding Dory, Finding Nemo, and all those fish get inside of that net, and they all start swimming in one direction, and you see the boat kind of rock like that? When he throws his net to the other side of the boat and he feels that pull, he feels it in his heart. Jesus called me once on this water, and now he's calling me again. He's reminding me. And here's the reason he's reminding Peter. This is the most important part. He's reminding Peter not because Peter is great. He knew Peter was going to fail. He's reminding Peter because Jesus is great. Because he said, I will make you a fisher of men. I don't expect you to go out and be a fisher of men. Peter, you caught nothing, but I own everything. And it's in that moment that Peter is reminded. I want to invite the band up as we, as we close here. We've seen the defining moment. We've seen the refining moment and the reminding moment of Peter. Just a little bit later, next chapter, Peter reinstates Jesus. He becomes the leader of the, of the apostles. Jesus ascends to heaven. Disciples go wait up in the upper room for the Holy Spirit to come down on the day of Pentecost. And then the Spirit is poured out and Peter gets up and preaches fire. Literal fire. You know, people say, I, I heard a sermon yesterday, it was fire. No, this was literal fire. Tongues of fire above their heads. You see, this is where we find Peter. We find Peter bold. We find Peter committed. We find Peter confident. After the Spirit falls, after he's had a defining, after he's had a refining, after he's had a reminding, he's now at chapter 13. He's not at chapter 3 anymore. He's now at chapter 13. And I love what it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 41. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Here it is. Peter cast the net. Jesus filled the net of that fisher of men. Pastor Mark said it earlier, that Jesus takes an earthly principle or an earthly story that will show us a heavenly meaning. That's what he did is he defined and refined and reminded Peter. Here's the thing I want you to hear this morning is that Jesus will take your failure and show you your future. Not because Peter was great, but because Jesus is great. I want to take a moment this morning as we get ready to close out. And I would love everybody to bow your head and close your eyes. If you're watching online and you're not driving, do the same. Bow your head, close your eyes. I think Jesus is going to meet us in a moment right here. For some of you, you're on the journey and you're standing on the shoreline. But you feel something in your heart. You're longing to experience Jesus in the deep. To be refined for the calling that he has on your life. I want to give you the opportunity to make your boat available. Just a moment, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. If you want to make your boat available this morning, I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you. If you say, Reese, I don't want to just hear Jesus on the shore. I want to experience him in the deep and give my life to him. This morning, I just want you to slip up your hand. If that's you, slip it up high so that I can see it. Amen. I see your hand. Amen. I see you. Hey, I see you there in the middle. Amen. Amen. I see you there in the front. Just slip it up high enough that I can see it. If you're on the shoreline and you've heard the teachings of Jesus, amen. And you want to experience him in the deep. If you're online, just put that online in the chat. We want to pray with you as well. He's calling us into the deep. He's calling us to cast our net. But there's another group this morning 
Maybe you already had a defining moment. Maybe you were going through the refining, and when I said the word valley, something stirred in your heart. You felt there was a call on your life. You felt like you were being prepared for a purpose, but you've lost that purpose. You've gone back to fishing. You said, I'm going to now do this in my own strength. I want to pray with you this morning as well. If you feel like you need a reminding moment, just slip up your hand. I want to pray with you as well. Amen. Amen. Just hold it up long enough. There we go. Amen. Amen. Well, Jesus is calling this morning. He's calling us into a deep, whether it is a defining moment or a reminding moment, he has something special for your life. I want to invite the prayer team up right now before we pray. And I want to tell you, if you raise your hand this morning, I want you to let someone know. I want you to let someone know you can come up here for prayer right afterwards. Let a member of our prayer team know that you made a defining moment decision or you made a reminding moment decision. We want to put a Bible in your hands. It isn't about the words here you hear at Crosswalk. It's about the words you're hearing from God's words that we are repeating. So you can go home yourself and read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and experience Jesus yourself. We want to put a Bible in your hands. And lastly, we want you to join a community. It could be this community. It could be another community. We can help you get connected to a community if you're a guest here or if you're online. But we want you to be a part of a community. Now, nobody prays alone. So I want you to, with all heads bowed and all eyes closed, I want you to say this prayer after me. Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I know I need forgiveness for those sins. And I know I need forgiveness for those sins. And I believe you died in my place. And I believe you died in my place. And you rose and defeated the grave. And you rose and defeated the grave. You did what I could not do. You did what I could not do. And you made a way for me. And you made a way for me. And I ask you to be my Lord and Savior. And I ask you to be my Lord and Savior. And I want to follow you all the days of my life. And I want to follow you all the days of my life. Amen. Amen.